Hey guys, welcome back. Joe Brunsman, Insurance Broker of the Stars. Today we're talking about why driver's license numbers are much more important than you probably realize. And this could have implications on not only how you personally deal with your driver's license, but also how your business or your clients deal with those driver's license numbers. So let's go ahead and jump on into it. All right, what's the problem with driver's license numbers? Well, first of all, businesses and just people in general don't understand the definition of PII. That's personally identifiable information. And why is that? Well, I understand. I mean, I've read all of them cover to cover, uh, but not everybody has the same love and interest as I do in cybersecurity law and cyber insurance. So I understand that there's just a complete lack of knowledge. That's one of the reasons I'm making this video. Next, people just throw their, their DLNs, aka driver's license number, they just throw it on with reckless abandon. So you'll see where if you're returning something at a store, uh, they want to scan your driver's license number. Probably a bad idea, and you'll see why uh, at the completion of this video. Now, because of that, businesses are comprised of people. People don't protect their driver's license numbers, which means that businesses generally don't really think about protecting a driver's license number like they would a social security number, per se. Now, this obviously leads to a lack of security around driver's license numbers and a bunch of follow-on problems that can result because of that. Now, just take a step back for a second and just pull out your own driver's license number. You can pause the video here and look what's actually on there. So you're going to see your age, your picture, your address, your date of birth, and your driver's license number. All a bunch of things that probably you don't necessarily want being out in the world because then that can lead to identity theft. Now, there's even more to this, and this is the forgotten regulatory side, and this is where businesses really need to pay attention to this. There could be both state and federal requirements that a business holding driver's license numbers would have to fall under. So let's just start with California here. This is the breach notification law of California. What is personal information definition? You'll see social security number makes sense, followed by a driver's license number. Now, what about New York? Social security number, driver's license number. What about Texas? Social security number, driver's license number. I think you guys kind of start to see the pattern here. Now, why is it that driver's license number is directly after social security number in all of these laws? Or put another way, like why would states actually even care about this? Well, at least three states already, and I'm sure more states are jumping on the bandwagon here, they're requiring the driver's license number of the primary tax filer for their state returns. Why are they doing that? Well, you know, social security numbers, which is what we've been using, um, are pretty much just kind of everywhere anyways. So these states are thinking, okay, how do we actually protect from both identity theft and tax return theft? So there's uh, both an altruistic and a true just monetary incentive there. How do we protect against that? Well, they're looking around and they're going, okay, well, what information do people have that we can verify that isn't necessarily already stolen and out in the world? And really the last bastion we have there is generally driver's license numbers. Now, this means if you go back and you think, okay, well, what happens if a social security number gets stolen? Well, obviously, if you're a business owner, that's a breach notification, credit monitoring. Uh, you have to bring in an attorney, forensics. There's all types of laws that you have to comply with. It's a mess. Well, this also means that if you're holding driver's license numbers, you may just likewise be subject to all 50 different state and territory breach notification laws, just as if you were holding the social security number of all those same people. That's pretty shocking to a lot of businesses out there. But wait, there's more. It also means that you may now have to follow all of their cybersecurity requirements. Now, if you want to learn more about that, there's a link at the end of this video where you can actually download my book, which jumps a little more into that uh, to try and elucidate that point. But suffice to say, it's not as easy and straightforward as most businesses would necessarily want to assume. So let's look at just Massachusetts for a second. So you'll see their personal information definition, social security number, driver's license number. Same as the states that we saw previously. Now, why is that important? Well, that means your business may actually be subject to something called Massachusetts 201 CMR 17, which is a giant pain. So you may reasonably fall under this if you have even one driver's license number that belongs to a Massachusetts resident. So what are some of those requirements in 201 CMR 17? Now, I'm just going to scan through here. Uh, you are more than welcome to pause the video here. 
But suffice to say, that's a lot of stuff. That's physical safeguards, administrative safeguards, and technical safeguards. So something like uh, we'll see mandatory employee training on computer and personal security. So surprise, you may have to now uh, do security awareness training for all of your staff. Likewise, uh, encryption of all information transmitted across public networks or wirelessly, restricting access, protected user authentication protocols, and on and on and on. The moral of the story here is if you're holding driver's license numbers, you could need much more cybersecurity and many more elements to that defense in depth than you would have just kind of reasonably assumed without knowing this information. But wait, oh wait, there's more. So remember at the beginning, I said there's both a state side, which we talked about, but there's also a federal side that's part of this as well. Now you'll see here, this is the United States of America, the Federal Trade Commission. So the FTC bringing action against Franklin's budget car sales, DBA Franklin Toyota Zion. So this is the federal government going after uh, really what appears for all intents and purposes, just a kind of a small out of the way car dealership in the middle of Georgia. Quick aside here, uh, I did a quick internet search. I wanted to find a picture of the actual dealership, but this is the first thing that popped up and you'll see uh, on, a, uh, on an internet search, you probably don't want the top two results of an internet search of your business name uh, to actually be the federal government coming after you uh, for some type of data breach or data enforcement or privacy law violation. So make sure you're keeping that in mind as a business owner. Um, I would not want that as a business owner. That would obviously scare me, rightly so, into increasing my cybersecurity budget to try and avoid that. But just kind of something to put in your back pocket there. Now, what were the actual allegations from the FTC? Well, you'll see here, in conducting business, respondent routinely collects personal information, blah, 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 including but not limited to driver's license numbers. Information for approximately 95,000 consumers, including but not limited to yada, 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 driver's license numbers, was made available on a P2P network. Such information can be easily misused to commit identity theft or fraud. So once again, the federal government is taking this seriously. Now, why did the FTC come after these guys or what violations were they alleging? Well, pretty easily you can say, okay, some violation of, let's say, the FTC Act. That would also make sense. But also this, violations of the safeguards rule. So you'll see the safeguards rule, which implements section blah, 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 requires financial institutions to protect security, confidentiality, and integrity of customer information. So... The point of this particular slide here is just to show you that nobody would just assume that a car dealership could be construed as a financial institution. So that is yet another reason why I'm not giving you legal advice, but you really probably want to consider this if you're a business that you get appropriate legal advice with competent legal counsel to really see what laws you may actually fall under. Um, I would be shocked if anybody at this car dealership ever assumed that they were construed as a financial institution. But nonetheless, the FTC believed that they were and came after them for it. Now, what happens if the FTC comes after you? What happens if these government regulators come after you? Well, this is just an example of a consent order that was put down following an FTC action. I put the uh, new, great, wonderful cybersecurity requirements that were put in place. That was actually highlighted in yellow. You're not supposed to read that, but if you look on the side of the screen here, these are all of the things that this business now has to implement and do, but wait, for 20 years. Now, I don't imagine any business owner out there would want 20 years worth of data security requirements hanging over their head, right? For the next two decades. I mean, that's just, that's a long time. And suffice to say, now all of those cybersecurity requirements are going to fall under. Well, every vendor they're going to deal with is going to have to double check and triple check every single thing they do. And there's probably going to be some additional price that's put in there for that, as well as the fact that these vendors are now going to know, hey, this is going to be overseen by the Federal Trade Commission and the federal government. Uh, yeah, we're going to charge a little more for that potential risk that could come back on us. So just yet another thing for you as a business owner to keep in mind. 
All right, moving forward here, I'm going to kind of uh, just close it on up here. One, just understand what you have on your systems, right? Now that you're just empowered with a little bit more knowledge as a business owner, make sure you understand what you have. Understand what you must protect. I did not go through every single element of what you have to protect as a business. Suffice to say, it's it's uh, pretty lengthy and probably more extensive than you would imagine, especially now that you know the driver's license numbers are part of that. But make sure you understand what it is you must protect. Protect your personal driver's license at all costs, I would say. like Don't just go flinging that thing around willy-nilly. It's much more important. Uh, hopefully, you understand that now uh, as we went through this presentation. Next, work with your IT or your MSP. Look at that defense in depth. Look at what additional reasonable controls you can put in place. In many instances, you know when I'm talking to businesses, especially after a breach, and I dealt with at least two a week last year just for my own client base, um, you know, a lot of times there were just very simple cybersecurity safeguards they didn't have in place. And in retrospect, they just feel really foolish because they're like, oh, well, if that would have saved me all of this pain and heartache and stress for something that was maybe a couple extra hundred bucks a month, they would have implemented that beforehand easily, uh, probably 10x that amount just to avoid the amount of stress following a breach. So work with your IT, your MSP, try and figure out, okay, what, what are those additional safeguards we could put in place? Um, and then, you know, with that, I understand that budget is an issue for every business. I'm also a business owner. But with that, you know, think about, okay, do you want state regulators coming after you mandating specific cybersecurity requirements? Do you want federal regulators coming after you doing the same where now you have to spend, say, two to three X what your budget was before? Strangely, businesses always find that budget after they've had an event. So I would just encourage you guys, please try and find that budget before the event occurs. Just take my word for it. It's going to be a lot less painful for you. Make sure you work with that competent legal counsel, uh, really kind of hand in hand with that MSP. Try and figure out what are those cybersecurity requirements that you actually fall under. And then finally, the last layer of defense in depth right? That reserve parachute is make sure you have an appropriate cyber insurance policy so that if you do unfortunately fall victim to some type of data breach, uh, that it's not going to, you know, potentially bankrupt your company. All right. With that, this is my latest book, Damage Control Cyber Insurance Compliance. That is where you can download it for free. With that, please like, share, comment, subscribe. I put out a new video every Thursday. You can poke around my channel. There's a bunch of other videos on here if you found that interesting. And with that, stay safe.